Okay, so we're going to look at this. Now we're exactly one session behind. And uh, I had a pretty good excuse for that other than um, the first session was actually two sessions. So the, the most recent um, master manual that I'm operating off of is 10 sessions. So it's okay. We have, we have free freedom to get two sessions behind and still finish on time. <laughs> okay, so nothing to be concerned about there. Let's, uh, let's start out with, with a question here. So what do you think? And please, everybody, uh, you don't have to weigh in, but that's, there's just, a, there's only four of us here. So uh, what do you think? How would you define the kingdom of God? Kevin? I know you have an opinion on this, my man. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking how I want to phrase it. All right. I mean, to me, a kingdom is basically one who is, is, is a place where basically the king reigns. Yeah. So he's in charge. Um, so the kingdom of heaven is basically God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost, sitting above all of us as basically his people um i mean that's kind of kind of how i do that but then but yet what what boggles the mind is when you turn around and look at it that we're adopted sons and daughters and all of that so we are also part of that kingdom we're not just subjects we're rulers as well Right, and that's 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 the hard part to get their mind wrapped around and how that works, but yet it does because God makes it work. So that's so it's some place where we can all rule as basically children of God. Okay, I think pretty much everything you said I would agree with. How about you, Michael? You got anything to add? Or Al? Um, I think that it's a, a, um, we are royalty, um, but, uh, but our loyalty is to God. Um, and it's about, um, It's a it's a kingdom of love and and um, of kingdom of of each person individual part of the body basically knowing their place and can being content with their place and um, and just wanting to you know it, it's it's like a perfect symphony I see it I mean there's no like in like in this worldly kingdom, you have uh, you have bad seeds that create problems within the kingdom. In heaven, it's a perfect kingdom, so everything is aligned and everything works as if it's a symphony, um, and um, it, it's in commu it's in communion together. So um, it's not about us being uh, alone. You know, yeah. Like I spend some of my time in this world. Okay. Um, now here's a curveball. How is the kingdom of God different from the Church of Jesus Christ? Um, the Church is a bride. I mean, that's always the image the Bible pulls it out. I yeah. mean, the bride is, I mean, we're waiting here patiently for Jesus to come get us as the bride. Um, we're not part of the kingdom yet in that situation. Um, so, I mean, we're yet to be pulled into. 
you know, that unity with, with, with Christ. Um, I mean, what? that's, that's where the church balances out at, at this point. I think God acts as, as, as the priest that does the marrying. <laughs> that brings us together. Oops. Somebody look up Colossians 1 and read 12 to 14, whoever's got their Bible handy. Well, I'm glad we're talking about this. What is the kingdom of God? So let me give you a couple of things. Now, I, I had a very unique privilege in the 70s of being able to sit under a man who was the only guy within the entire global Foursquare organization that preached the kingdom of God. They didn't preach the church. We were in a, we were gathered as the church because the word church is not really church, it's ecclesia. Church, the name church was invented by King James in order to gain more political power by his position as the, 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 uh, the monarch of the church on earth right. after they separated from, um, from Rome. And so he created a new entity called the church, and it was more site-centric, and it was organizationally centric under him. Uh, before that, all the Bible translations were used the word ecclesia or called out. So called together into oneness is the church. The kingdom is sent out to invade darkness. And it's church people that are sent out, but many, many church people never understand or do that. So you can't equivocate the two. And Jesus never, never preached about the church. That organization and infrastructure was developed after he went to heaven. What he preached and what John the Baptist preached in advance of him was the kingdom of heaven is here now. It is... The kingdom of heaven is the realm in which the church operates outward. The church or the ecclesia is a place where the church gathers together inward. And that's a big, big difference. And both are contemporary. Both are in real time. And, and, and one is invasive and taking ground with the authority God's given us as the king's men. We are, he is our liege Lord. Um, and so we live in the realm of the kingdom on earth. We're connected to each other as one body, which is also referred to as the bride on earth. But that connectivity is meant for nurturing, strengthening, edification, so we can be sent out as people of the kingdom. So who has that verse that they could read for us? It kind of ties together with what we were just talking about. Are you looking at Colossians 1.12, you said? Yes, Colossians um, 1, 12 through 14, please. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saint in light, who have delivered from us the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption throughout his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Okay. So you may even be able to say that we are the saints in light. The saints, I have to do a study on whether saints are uh, the membership term for the kingdom or whether it's the membership term for the body. I, I got myself a little bit confused here because of the saints. So we are members of the bride. Saints may be the operational you know, we're the pawns moving out. Pawns not in a bad way. We're on the chessboard. And, and then there's some bishops and kings and stuff and, and, and knights who are moving out. And I don't want to paint a, a, a medieval picture here. This is, this is um, very Middle Eastern in its design. So, so let's look at a couple of words here. It says that, that we are uh, a realm of warriors and priests. 
And so we've been translated, that word that you just read, Kevin, we've been translated. And so this word translated is mythistemi. It means to transpose or to transfer or to remove from one place to another. Now, this is, this is, this is a fait accompli. In other words, it's already happened. We've already been translated. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness, for the power of darkness, into the kingdom and the power of the kingdom of God. And so that's where sonship happens. Membership happens in the church. And we get this very, very all blended up in the blender. And what happens is most of the time the church just stays put and does churchy things. But the church is, is not just a hospital for the sick, and it is that. It's the equipping center for the saints so that we can go out. And so in a sense, everything that we do at Core 300 is about equipping saints to go out. And you may have kind of picked that up, right? This is We're trying to operationalize the body, the church members, the ecclesia members, to fulfill their mission. And the mission is not to be the best usher in the world. That may be a training post, but the mission and the purpose that each of us have, it is locked up in God. And he wants to release that. And if anybody thinks that they're too old to find their purpose, you're wrong. Um, I mean, aside from people who are with hospice, we've all got gain if we have it in our head. That's why Caleb, at 83 years old, said to Joshua, give me this mountain. It was promised to me. It's, it's my purpose in life is to gain the inheritance for my family and for my sons. And so no one else can take this mountain that's filled with giants, me and my sons. I've trained them for this moment. And we have an army, and we're going to go take that. And Joshua said, go for it, because no one else could take it. That's an 83-year-old man. He didn't really fulfill his purpose. Remember, he had the purpose. He was one of the 12 slaves. But somehow that guy kept his edge on. He kept his blade wet and sharp until that moment. And he fulfilled his calling. And I'm sure sometime soon thereafter, he, he passed away. So we're translated into this kingdom. Now, the word kingdom here is the biggest possible word that we have in the language. Now, what do you call something that has generations of power and expansion? You look back in history. Do you call it a kingdom, or what do you call that? Well, it's kind of a trick question. We, well, call, that... we call the period between 300 B.C., that 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 came out of came out of Italy from 300 BC to about 500 AD that 800 years we call that the Roman what empire empire this word kingdom is the name for empire this is the empire of God it's pretty heavy duty and it lasts forever and it always has been and it always shall be but it's up until the gospel came now, the Jews didn't get it. The Jews were kind of like the church is today, in the sense they gathered together, they had their feast, they did all these things, but they never went out, unless you had a couple of kings, like David was an empire builder. So was Solomon. Solomon wasn't, a, Solomon did some fighting, but he, he came in on, in the wake of David. And so David had this vision of, of a kingdom. And God was to be the king of Israel, but then th they, they whined for so many centuries about it. He finally gave in and let them have a king. So we're translated into it when we're born again. The kingdom is an empire. And, and um, we've been adopted into the family of God, which is different than being baptized as a member of the body of Christ. We've been adopted into the kingdom as God's sons and daughters. And that makes, we've been adopted as joint heirs. Um, somebody would like to read 1 Peter 2, 9. 
This is where Peter quotes um, Exodus 19, 6. So, Great, great, great. So, so if somebody flip to Romans 8, 17 and hold that place. So, so that doesn't sound much like the church, but it sounds a lot like the kingdom, doesn't it? What you just read, Al, it, it sounds like he's talking about this, this place where God's holy light is and, and, and um, we're, we're a royal priesthood. This is under the king. So we're priests and we're kings. And that's what Moses says. We're a kingdom of priests and kings. We have the royalty blood, the royal blood of Christ, but we are priesting. So the priest goes out many times, in the, a few times in the Old Testament, the priest went out in front of the army. There's something, there's something of a priest in leadership. Priesting, if you could make that into a verb, which is, is, is inappropriate, but works at this moment. God, God is calling us to preach, to be priesting for him, we're going out as a vanguard. And so what we're doing is we're doing it for his glory. Because scripture says, whenever we lift up Christ, whenever we lift up God, he draws all men to himself. And the word lift up there is, is proclaiming the actual crucifixion where Christ was lifted up on the cross. You still with us, Michael? Do you have to go somewhere? Okay, so um, go ahead and read uh, Romans 8, 17. You know, actually, I, I have it here. I have it here in front of me. Uh, Paul writes, if we are children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we might also be glorified together with him. And you know, God just always has to throw that supper thing in there, doesn't he? <laughs> Everything looks great. Everything looks awesome. I can hear the, the French horns blowing, and the drums beating. We're marching down in the parade, and we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. There's this, we got to get blooded. You know, the turn that hunters use, you got to get blooded before you're an official hunter. You gotta get blooded and be willing to suffer with him in order for us to participate in, in, in being glorified together with him one day. And so suffering is a component of the kingdom. So we gotta remember that. And especially when you go out and, and you're moving goodness into evil, there's a, there's, a suffer, there's a veil of suffering we have to pass through because the enemy now is no longer just trying to make us not a factor and minimize us and, and lie to us. And we're on the offensive. And when you get on the offensive, it, your suffering component increases. And so there's, there's, there's a price to pay. And Paul talked about that. I, you know, I fought the fight, you know, I, I, I fought the battle. I took it to the enemy. And, and, and I've reached for and fulfilled my purpose on earth. That's kingdom language. It's not church language. So the church's role is to launch people out. Even the word apostle means one who is sent out. So we all have a, a component of all of us being apostolic, that we're sent out to bring light into darkness, to rescue the captives, to set them free, you know, to bring that cold drink of water to the prisoner, to, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to love on and protect the orphans and the widows in their distress. Uh, we have an operational calling outward to redeem the planet from what mankind through Satan's machinations has done on earth to create more and more sorrows and suffering. You know, the only way we have the metal in our soul and in, um, in uh, the, the fiber in our spine 
to be able to go out and rescue people that are suffering is to know suffering ourselves. That's why Jesus had to suffer in order to redeem us. So th this isn't just a one and done. This is this becomes a piece of our lifestyle. And, and we've got far too few men and women that are kingdom oriented. See, it's like, kind of like we get together around the table for Thanksgiving. We're family. We're holding hands. We're eating like pigs. We're having a great. That's, that's church, right? We're being edified. We're having a good time. We're not under assault. But when we go out to work, we get on the freeway, we fight traffic, we, we have pressures, we got bills to pay. Now, that's, that's what most people would say, well, that's reality, too. But once you become comfortable with the meals that are being fed by the shepherds, so much so that, you know, we hardly, it's too much an effort just to get up and relieve ourselves spiritually, you know. We're just getting being more and more and more bloated. All of that protein that comes in turns into fat. We know that from a biological standpoint. And so it's also true. We get all the protein and the meat of the word and we let it just settle into our bodies and we become lethargic because no one's teaching us that. No, the reason you're eating right now is to go out and, and lead captivity captive. To bind up the brokenhearted. This is... You know, have you ever talk to someone and try to comfort them when they're brokenhearted? They're suffering there for you to be able to, to speak to that person because you're feeling their pain. This is messy stuff and it's unpredictable. And so God says, here's your family. Start working with your family now as a servant leader. And that's why we're talking. We'll be going into fathering later on in this course. We'll be going into husbanding uh, and, and that sort of thing. So because that's where most believers are, are designed by God to cut their teeth. And then we learn to serve each other within the body of Christ so that we can go out and then bring the dominion of the empire of God with us. And this is an attitude, guys. This is an attitude. And, and once you put on that helmet of salvation, it brings with it an attitude. It's not just about battling terrible thoughts, playing defense. The helmet of salvation is you're putting on the very mind of Christ, who is the carrier and the object of our worship in the kingdom of God. He's the king. And so we put on the helmet of salvation of the Savior, and we are, begin to operate as outgoing and, and as uh, we're thinking like God, we're thinking strategically. We're as wise as serpents now. We have to be wiser than the serpent. The only creature in all creation that's ever been wiser than the serpent is God himself. And that's where God can trick the trickster. Well, um, so let's look at this word joint, joint heirs. It's a Greek word is, um, let me go move past here. So we're joint heirs. We're part of the royal priesthood. We've been given authority for rulership. And we are a uh, community of kings and priests. Uh, before we get into the metaphysical components of, of dualism, um, this word, boy, I'm going to try to say this. It's sikleronomos. Uh, sikleronomos, all kinds of weird markers around it. It's a Greek word. And it means join air. It's the word that Paul used it, used in his teachings. And it means one who obtains something, something, one who gains something that's assigned to him by another in a joint inheritance. And probably you've heard sermons and it, it works pretty well. It's like it's like we, we got two signature checkbooks that are given to us for the kingdom, not not for. God give me another Cadillac, but it's for the kingdom to give me the resources to move outward. And, and that includes a lot of resources, it includes, you know, emotional, physical, spiritual strength. It includes uh, the knowledge, the revelation that you prayed about, uh, Michael. Um, and and, and when, we, when we share this inheritance with Christ, it's like he left behind the church. And he said, do enterprise until I come back again. 
be in the business of the kingdom until I come back. That was one of his last words to this fledgling church that are gathered together. And that joint inheritance is that it gives us a checkbook and he signed his signature and he's the main signatory. And he says, here's all you got to do is sign this by faith and put the kingdom into practice and expand it in my name. And this is, this is really just um, sound, sound theology. I mean, a lot of the stuff, there's whole sections on the kingdom of God that can be theoretical or we can make it practical. And so we've been given authority now in that checkbook in the co-signing that's already been done on, in heaven now here on earth. So, so let's have a Troika talk before we go into dualism. Um, and it uh, looks like we'll have two Troikas. Uh, so, so in the Troika, discuss together, how does this change the way we pray? Are we gonna pray as a churchman? Or are we gonna pray as a kingdom man? And, uh, and are we gonna pray as a, an inferior here on earth? Or as he who rules and reigns with Christ in heavenly places, seated with him, down upon the principalities and powers. We're praying down to, see, whoever has higher ground usually wins the battle. We've got the higher ground. This is just what we've been going over. We have the higher ground. And so we don't pray up through the principalities and powers and ask God to part the waters. We pray down in Jesus' name, seated with him, and tell the enemy what God is doing to them right now. That's our authority. It's not begging Jesus. We're with Jesus. And just like, just like Gideon and God came together, he says, we together, Gideon, are going to take the Midianites. There's a partnership, but our partnership is in heaven. It's not through some far away, distant handshake that we touch fingers every once in a while, like a Michelangelo painting. This is real stuff. But again, it's a frame of mind that comes with the, with the seeing of the light through the helmet of salvation. So how is this going to change your prayer? Let's talk about that a little bit, all right? All right. So um, the priesthood of the believer, dualism. So dualism is something that has a lot of meanings in philosophy. It can be done in science, used in science. Um, but it's a... It's generally used as a metaphysical kind of ideological doctrine that there are two distinctive independent types of being, one material and other spiritual, that are coexisting in the same time. So we're not talking about a parallel universe. We're talking about dualism in this universe, all in the same time frame. Um, and in, in Paul's, I'm going to, I lost my, lost my way here for a moment. No, that's not it. Gallery? Huh. I'm trying to go one view, standard. Well, I'm having a hard time getting to my uh, getting out of this controlling. I'm gonna I'm gonna take away. I'm gonna stop sharing. You can hit escape too. Escape. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Ah, there we are. Escape. Thank you. You're welcome, Miguel. Okay. So um, l l let's start out by. But by looking at the Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer is a fantastic example of dualism. Now, a lot of us learned, like I did as a kid, to say the Lord's Prayer, say it over and over and over. It was the way that I got through church because I could say the Lord's Prayer between 90 and 120 times <laughs> to myself when I was going through the boring part where, you know, where they made you sit and listen to some guy in a, in a black robe saying things. He's talking over your head because you're 11 years old. So I said the Lord's Prayer a lot, 
but not with not with understanding. And, and most of us have been through some really good teaching on the Lord's Prayer, so I don't want to get into that. But let's just look at the, what's going on in the Lord's Prayer. So we got our Father, our Father. Okay, so dualism. We're calling him our Father, but technically, theologically, he's not here. But the Father is in the Holy Spirit because they're one. They're connected. But Jesus, you know, looking up, bless the food. He, he's talking to the Father. That's, that's in the kingdom of his dear son or what we call heaven, that place of heaven, the eternal city where God rules and reigns over all the universe. And so our Father, who is in heaven, Jesus un underscores that, holy is your name. And now remember that we're supposed to pray that your kingdom come. Mm -hmm. See the dualism? Mm -hmm. your will be done on earth in the same way it's happening in heaven. So mm -hmm. he just starts out the whole prayer with dualism. It's a classic example. And it comes right from the mouth of Jesus as to how we should pray. Um, that, that a couple of words in here are, are important. When he says thy kingdom come, it, it's a bidden invitation. It's, it's a, it's, it's a command to come and sit down. It's like when you're late for dinner and they're, they're around the table as a kid, I'd get in trouble because I knew at six o'clock when that clock went off far, you know, two miles away at the courthouse, I better be in my, in my seat at six o'clock for dinner. And I still come time, sometimes be hauling and my family be waiting and my dad's face is red because it's 6.02. Tells you a little bit something about my family. But it was like, get in here and sit down. And so come, Lord, let your kingdom come. And you want your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we then he goes into give us this day our daily bread. Give us, now that we've invited the kingdom to come, um, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So Father in heaven, from heaven, forgive us our sins in the same way that we do on earth, we forgive others. So there's a condition right there. And really the only condition that's in the Lord's prayer is the condition that we are forgiving those who sin against us. You see that? Everything else is a welcome and a bidding to come and join us and bring your kingdom come here, Lord on earth let your will be done on earth and so the purpose of the kingdom on earth and jesus was the embodiment of the kingdom and so the purpose of the kingdom on earth that he left behind with us he gave peter the keys to unlock the kingdom in his apostolic role which is passes on to all of us as people who are sent and so now we we have the keys to bind and to loose, to, to free captives, and to bind up the enemy and prevent him from operating within our sphere here on earth in the name of the king. And, and, and we're asking for a daily bread. Well, there's dualism right there. We know that Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And yet he broke bread and, and served it to both the disciples and also when he fed the 5,000. So it, the bread is dualistic, the bread of life on earth, the bread of life in heaven, and real bread that we're saying God provide for us. And forgive us our trespasses from heaven to the same rate that we forgive those who sin against us. That's how we bring forgiveness into our operating lives is by being people who said, by faith, I'm going to forgive those who are nasty and doing me harm and even, even loving them. So there's a cause and an effect. It's a deal that God's doing that. And, and Jesus repeats that in Matthew 5. Um, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And pretty much that's it. You know, deliver us from, from the enemy. Well, that's what's going to happen if we become people who recognize we're walking in the kingdom with the king. Um, okay, so we kind of went through this already. 
So, so, so there's really a contract in here that God says, I'm going to do all this stuff. You just keep forgiving people, people like you just keep forgiving them and, and, and be ready to go. And, um, and Lord, we're asking you not to trap us or lead us into temptation or let those things happen. Protect us from the evil one, which is actually the word. It's not evil. It's the evil one that's used. So you can, there's some uh, scriptures here that you can write down. I think they're in your, in your manual, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. Because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace we've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us, us with him in the heavenly realms. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. We give thanks unto the Father. And think of the environment again of the Lord's Prayer. We're giving thanks to the Father. Okay, we're back to the Lord's Prayer there a bit, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We already read this earlier, didn't we? <laughs> Sorry. And he's delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So um, eschatology is um, a term. It means the last things. It's just eschatos is a great word for the last. So eschatology is the science of studying or the knowledge of understanding the end times. That's all it is. Fancy word. I don't know why they didn't just say the knowledge of the end times, right? But we got to come up with words to make sure that the smarter people on the left side of the room. <laughs> um, and it's from a Christian biblical perspective, including death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Kingdom of God, uh, the word basilea, again, we talked about this already. I just got ahead of myself is that realm or empire of God, the presence, power, dominion of God as it is expressed in the heavens is, is, is no longer defined by geography, but by authority and dominion. So now we get into looking at um, these different diagrams are meant to help us understand how we're walking. Because if we see our walk on earth as only a church, a church person, and without this greater understanding that we are also activated as a kingdom person. See, the church is like a town in the kingdom. The local church is simply an operating town hall within the kingdom of God. It's, it's regional, it's local, the local church. Now, there is the church worldwide which also includes those who have already died and those who will be coming into the church in the future. But the church is a, is, a, is a dot on the map, but the map is the kingdom. So the authority of Rome was with the common Roman legionnaire and with the centurion as he expressed the greatest faith that Jesus had ever seen and he had ever seen. Now, he, is he talking as the son of God or as Jesus of Nazareth? I prefer to think he's talking that in all of my years as God, I've never seen faith as great as this man who understands the kingdom of Rome, who had already translated his understanding of, of the empire of Rome into the empire of the kingdom by observing how Jesus moved in authority. Wow. It took a, it took a non-believer who understands the military authority to make that connection. And he had never seen that from Moses, Abraham, or anyone else. That's pretty, pretty awesome. This is why understanding warfare is so important for how we frame God's empire. And it's also why many churches don't teach it because of fear. And where, what is the spirit of fear? It's a demon, right? Yeah, enemy. It's a demon. <clears throat> So, so, so this is like, okay, we come to a place in our life, uh, I'm just used the age 30 as a random thing here, and something happens, and where our name is written in the last book of life, we're, we're, we're adopted, and uh, these are all theological truths that happen at that moment. Of course, you don't know this when you're first saved, right? You just know you feel better, and, and, and somehow you feel God in you or around you, and you're around other believers, and it's wonderful. You're in your baby state 
of being held, so to speak, and being fed pablum to get you, to get your sea legs. At some point in time, you have to stand up and walk. And 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 there's there's churches that have never had seen a walking believer member of their own church because they're they're, they're feeding a pablum. Now, I think most churches have some real real warriors in them. They have some real strong men and women of faith. But by and large, many of them are not deployed. It's the rare church that has this game going on that understands that they're a, a spot on the map within the kingdom. And their role is to send forth, like, like Antioch. Antioch was a little different than Jerusalem. Jerusalem was kind of, we're in one place. But Antioch was always sending out. They were the sending out church and the church planters. That's a better model for us for, the, for a healthy church. So we, we live our life on earth, but somehow now we have this increased sense of right and wrong, and we want to please our Father in heaven. We've been freed from some habits, maybe. We've been freed from other things, and we start to improve. So this is this little mark here, if you follow my mouse. Actually, I need to put that over here. If you follow my mouse, this little mark is kind of like, you know, I've had some bad days. I had some great days where I feel like I'm on my way to glory, and then I have a setback, and over the years, we hope that we're becoming a little more like Christ until we get into heaven, and then everything goes great. Then we just skyrocket up to the top here with our new body, and we're in perfection, and our, our tears are wiped away, and all that kind of great stuff. So that's how I saw heaven until I began studying and then having to teach more on the kingdom, and this is a dimension. It, it's it's reality, but it's just not the whole reality. So here we have es eschatological dualism. And again, in, this, in any New Testament theology uh, and um, theological books, um, you're going to see this, uh, these kind of ideas. Now, I've never seen the diagrams or something that I kind of tried to figure out by using diagrams, but so here we are now and we're talking about what is it like to be translated uh, into the kingdom and at the same time and be partakers of, of eternal life, but at the same time, we still got this life on, on earth, right? Our performance as pure believers is still, you know, still imperfect. And, and we may try to pretend that we've got our act together, but we know none of us do, to the extent that maybe other people think we do. And uh, there's that whole thing about posturing and posing and false armor that comes with religion too. It's not just trying to be a man's man and have our swag in business or as the patriarch of our family, but, but there's this thing even within among religious people we want to we want to put on a front that we've got our religious act together and god and i were really tight when it may not be true at least at that moment so um so here you have the same picture but but understanding that wait a minute i've been instantly translated up into heaven and i am walking in a heavenly realm right now i have a heavenly address i have a heavenly place of battle seated with Christ in heavenly places, where it says all principalities and powers cower at his feet. Now we're with him. We're not at his feet, though we may worship that way, which is fine. But our position of authority is with him in that same position of authority over, over the demonic forces. Now, so this, this is another way to see it. And when we're moving more towards reality. So we have a life on earth. When we die, we get to unite with this spiritual being that we are as well as the Son of God, and all is well. But it all happens at the transaction. When we say, I surrender all, God takes that seriously. Even when we try to take it back and live our own life, we, we're miserable, right? The only sinner that's more miserable than a sinner is a Christian sinner. It's just miserable, right? And you make other people miserable. And, and so we're ruined for sin. We didn't necessarily sign up for that in the beginning, you know, but God in his grace takes us from stage to stage. 
So, so this is our journey. So how do we live in two places at once? Right? How can we live in two places at once? Well, that's, that's our troika, and, and this is going to be a long troika, but now that we kind of spent a lot of time on the last troika, which is supposed to be short, I'm going to knock this down to about uh, 12 minutes, Al. All right. So let me, let me give you some of the fill in the blanks here about life eternal. Zoe Ainos is the two Greek, Greek words. We recognize Zoe as in zoology which is pretty much looked at, at, you know, there's botany, all the plants, and then there's zoology, all the animals and critters. And then there's that place in between of the fungi and the not so fungi, and all that kind of stuff in between. Um, so life eternal is now and in the present. There's a blank to fill in. Um, we are now undercover right now. Our mission here on earth is you see, we're taking back the planet infrastructure and governance in the spiritual realm first. And that will lead to placement in positions of favor throughout time. Now this has happened, uh, probably the best time you could say this actually happened was under Emperor Constantine, who was a young believer when, when he assumed the throne, but his faith expanded through his empire. And, and the results of him inventing nursing homes, inventing orphanages, inventing um, uh, and, and adopting uh, multiple faiths and religions, the tolerance as the law of Rome. None of those things existed. A ban he banned all animal sacrifice and thereby crushed the, 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 the Roman practice of religion. And when he took, when he took um, authority over the, the kingdom in around 306 AD, he was a new believer, but his mom was a very, very deep believer. We call her St. Helena. And she was became his number one counselor through his entire reign. And um, she's the first missionary that went to the Holy Land. And she uncovered all of the sites that were filled in with mortar and stone. Every place that we would call the Holy Land, holy place, was uh, Rome had erected, the Roman emperors had erected different uh, pagan temples for sacrifice on and she cleared all that out and um, she was amazing later she was 72 when she went to jerusalem with an army um just a little sidebar there but the thing is the kingdom of heaven was operating through constantine he wasn't a perfect man um and he didn't have a definitely didn't have a perfect family but when he took over there were 10% of the entire Roman Empire was Christian, very, very small percentage. When he died, 90% of the Roman Empire have given their lives to Christ. And this was still close enough where the church was the church. You know, he oversaw the, the first, um, the Council of Nicaea and several others after that. He was the presiding bishop among the bishops. 300 and some bishops throughout the, the, the empire. He paid all the expenses for the bishops to come together. And that's where, um, and that took place around 307 AD. And that was where we get the Nicene Creed. That was under his stewardship to come up with the statement of faith that we still use today. It's actually on our website. So that's what happens when you get, now, of course, he came into power by war, conquering evil, other other evil Caesars. There was a total of four Caesars, and he conquered the other two because he didn't want to, but they kept killing Christians. And it and they would break his promises to him. So he'd just attack him and God would be his favor. And he took over all of that property. So and I'm not advocating that. Far too complicated word uh, world. I don't want to get involved in politics. Definitely not me, but I'm not trying to lean you in that direction unless that's a calling to, to invade that dark place with goodness in the kingdom of God. And there are many, many men and women who have done that. But we are now undercover alien subversives. Okay, I like that. We're aliens because our citizenship is in heaven and it's more powerful than our citizenship 
we have a temporary citizenship as Americans, assuming everyone on this call is an American. It's a temporary citizenship. It's a, it's an um, an earthly citizenship. But our real citizenship is in heaven. So we're subversives because we're bringing in the kingdom of God into the kingdom of this uh, of this world, the kingdom of His dear Son to supplant and return control to earth, which Adam gave up by the usurper, the serpent. And that legal exchange that happened, Satan gained the right to rule over mankind because he seduced the woman and the man into eating the forbidden fruit. That transgression is the shot heard around the world every year and every moment. Um, so there's a spiritual mystery of membership in the body of Christ. That's our membership. Our community is the, is the believers. We don't have community, real true community, not heavenly community with non-believers. We can have friendships. We should. We have heavenly priorities and earthly responsibilities to lead. Um, um, and of course, the Great Commission. We have, we have, we've been given a belonging to the eternal family. Wow. We belong. No man, no woman, no child has to be alone. We belong to that fraternity. And we've been identified in Romans 8.37 as overcomers. See, that's, you know, you, you see sometimes you talk to somebody that's maybe aggressive in athletics or debate or whatever and you say that guy's a winner but god says to you you're an overcomer and it's a part of our identity that goes with sonship we are that now we may act out from underneath that but who we are is we are overcoming sons and daughters of god okay now we can go into the troika so how do we live in two places at once which kingdom do you long for? Hmm. Okay, guys. So let's let's get let's get honest here. <laughs> Where's your longing? I'll tell you. There's there's a decade or two, or maybe two and a half decades of my adult life where I had some serious longings for a better neighborhood and a bigger house and a fancier car and a better title and a bigger salary. Those were my longings. And yet I was a believer, but I didn't walk in the things we're talking about here. But how can you be in two places? Kevin uh, brought this up. How do we live in two places at the same time? How can that be practical? Right? So Kevin and I were just turning the corner as to how can we help each other cope with this dual life? We just kind of came up with the concept, which I think is pretty common for most of us, that we don't do it enough. We yearn for it. There's nothing sweeter than just basking in the presence of God and pressing into that sense of abiding. Like a branch abides in the vine, the branch isn't doing anything. It's just connected, totally connected organically to the vine. And that's a picture that I use in my prayer to say, am I, am I here? Am I stressing out? Are my branches on the ground? Am I holding up the vine? <laughs> How foolish, right? But how can we help each other with this dual life? I mean, I don't know what the answer is. This is a high-powered piece of equipment, and we all rely on it for practical things and some more for entertainment, or and some just to fill the gaps at a bus stop, every bus stop in life, whatever that could be. Um, and yet it's going to fail me unless I plug it in, leave it alone and charge it. And, and this, this living in two places is making the priority for me. And I'm going to use this in my thinking. This is helping me because we're sharing together tonight, helping me to make sure that I plug in, in that heavenly place in Christ that I plug in and abide. And not run around and try to do all the kingdom stuff because I have I literally have the ideal life of being a, 
and my job is to be a kingdom person. It's just amazing. But we all are, you know, like 24 seven. That doesn't mean you know, I am that, that greater kingdom person, but that's actually my job description. But it's, so it's really tempting for me to do kingdom stuff, religious stuff or strategy or phone calls, whatever else. But, but I, I, I run out of gas. I ran out of gas because I'm not plugging in. I got. I'm going to remember that. So my cell phone is an illustration. I don't know if it'll help you or not, but it's it's so practical, right? And then once if we plug in long enough, then we have that energy. We have that face time to give that energy to other people, right? As a kingdom person, because they see Jesus in us. But if we're not charged, we're going to go dark. We're not going to, we're just going to be a person. We're not going to be that person that is a child of God, which is a miracle. Okay. Good. Well, he's kind of my mentor. You know that. All right, so let me see if we can get through one thing. Okay, let's close with this. I think, I think this is the, the one we can close in. We just got a couple minutes left. So now this kind of takes the whole picture together and makes that simple diagram more complex, which is kind of like my lot in life, you know, make something simple, complex. But so we've got this kingdom of heaven and kingdom of earth was there in the garden and God would come down, he'd walk with Adam and it was the ideal situation. And then, and then what happened is that the fall happened and we all, all of Adam's seed were baseline at, at this fallen place when Adam and Eve fell and uh, subjectively we became a part of that race, whatever their seed was. And so now you recognize they're going going through the Old Testament now. God placed the law in there where we try to have, try to be good, and we fail. We a little better days, and we're moving towards developing our conscience, becoming more conscientious, becoming more empathetic, growing as a human being to be a better person. But we still got this life on Earth, and then and then what we're what we're right on the edge of now is we're waiting for Christ. So in that waiting period. Christ came that began that this final age and the paradise for the righteous few. And those are listed in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 12, and um, some of the great Bible actors that we know and many that we don't know, many more that we don't know were, were righteous people that somehow under the law, there was a special grace for those that were good. and no special grace for those that were evil. So you see the blue and the red. When Christ came, paradise was emptied of the righteous. That's why the graves opened and people saw Moses and others. Um, and, and so the righteous were then taken up into heaven and they wait now as, our, as spectators of our life. Your and my life is in the arena of heaven per Hebrews chapter 12. And we run the race and they cheer us on. And I think that's, that's the picture that the writer of Hebrews painted. And I had an influence actually in, in the warrior course. So now we're all waiting. But we get to have this, during this time, we get to have this es eschatological dualism as our right and privilege to live in both times. And yet he, God didn't give us two minds. We can be scattered but when we focus, we're either going to be focusing on earth and earthly things, which isn't necessarily evil. That's doing our work. That's the day to day. And, and even as we minister, plowing and, and serving and, and ministering. But then we have that, that time in heaven where we, we, we raise up into heavenly places and we go into this contemplative prayer or meditative prayer or uh, sometimes we ascend into heaven in worship 
to glorify God, and we feel that that otherworldliness of our uh, of our um, exaltation and our joy in heavenly places. So the object of tonight then is let's be let's be men who live each day in both places, and to be to be cognizant of that our authority and our power and our inheritance has already been activated. It's not just the sweet by and by, but before he wipes every wipes away every tear, here in the now, he's called us to, to rule and reign with him as we worship and adore him and obey him. Amen? Amen. All right. See you guys next week. And um, for, the, for the Troika, excuse me, let me see. Yeah, there's an, okay, so uh, what I'd like to ask you guys to do, based, Matthew was known as the book of the kingdom. So I'd like you to read now, put on your kingdom lens, and, and, and if you'll go, do you mark, if you don't mark up your Bible, I want to recommend you do that. Maybe you came from a place where writing your Bible was somehow uh, disgraceful or undesirable, but but I, I, my Bibles have notes all over them. So I'll remember and I'll put little dates in there or an understanding and then of course journaling, but you don't have to do all of that. Just in Matthew, whenever you see the word kingdom or king, underline it. You'll have, a, you'll have that to go back to to remind you about, about the kingdom. Because that's, that's where we get our theology of what we've been talking about tonight. Read chapter three of Destined for the Throne. If you've already read three, read four. Um, some of you have chosen, I think I've, I've been confusing on this, so I apologize. It doesn't really matter what order you read the books in, though I think it's preferable to read Hayford first and then Destined for the Throne second as we mature in our thinking through this course. And um, huh, attend this or next week's SWAT men's prayer meeting. Okay, that's from an earlier version. We don't have that in this course anymore. So. Uh, SWAT means spiritual warfare and tactics. So I guess I could say, modify that. Let's be operating in our authority. Take captive thoughts, um, rule and reign over the things that are trying to rule and reign over you. Fight the good fight. And if, you're, if, you're, if your knees are buckling, grab a buddy. All right? Grab a troika mate, just like we learned in the warrior course, whoever that is in your life. And let's stand together. We're so much stronger together. I love you guys. Good night.